this hour in the northern city in the United States. 3823 South Ellis on the south side of Chicago was built in 1901. Since 1945, only Negroes have lived here. One of the first Negro tenants to move in was Mrs. Georgia Johnson, apartment one north. When I came here 10 years ago, it had a beautiful green lawn, and I couldn't believe it. Beautiful glass doors and everything. Then I come inside, open the door. It was nice, the wall was all nice. Mailboxes is all on, uh, it's all out in the vestibule, all on the stairway. The wall was all nicely painted. It just really was a beautiful place. According to the tenants, the building was kept in good condition until 1962 when it changed ownership. The apartments off this stairway contain five or six rooms and rent for $105 or $110 a month. Five of the nine families living here in the summer of 1966 are headed by women. In apartment four south, Mrs. Lindora Moore and her eight children. Below the Moors, the Barbers, 12 people living in six rooms. In apartment two south, Bercy Phillips and her six children. In the apartment below, Gladys Milner, she has five children. Next door to the Milners, Mrs. Georgia Johnson and her five children. Only two families are headed by fathers. The Wilbins, Floyd Wilbin, works in a steel mill. Bill Staples, a Korean War veteran, works in an electronics factory. He and his wife, Gloria, have nine children. Living in the basement apartment, Jack Beckwith and his wife. Mr. Beckwith is unemployed. In 1966, the tenants paid $11,700 in rent to the F.W. Harsh Jr. Realty Company for the privilege of living here 365 days of the year. The days begin in the alley in back of the tenement. It's 5.30 a.m. Uh, on my back porch, you can. It's nice. It's real pretty, you know, when it comes up. Real yellow, real light yellow. Hey, everybody had the willpower to get up and go and do something, but it seems like nobody wants to do it anymore. So you can't do no one lay around all the daydream. Avenue at 8 a.m. on a weekday morning. You don't see too many people about 8 o'clock because most of them be in the bed sleep. Some of them don't have any jobs and things like that. In the tenement, at least one person has been up before dawn. I get up at 4.30 in the morning. By 15 to 5, I'm on my knees praying. And 5 o'clock, I'm sitting back in my kitchen reading, fretting out their self because of evildoers. The 37 Psalms, fretting out their self because of evildoers. I read it that every morning. Then I'm going on with my housework. When I'm working, I'm thinking about God. If I had a know God, like I know now, my marriage never broke up. Apartment 3 South, Mrs. Thelma Barber, a widow, does the washing for 12 people in her family. Well, I never was a little girl. I never were. I always was grown up. I started cooking when I was seven years old, and I was doing how and taking care of smaller kids under me. I just got married early and regretted it afterwards but uh, what could you do about it? I was a mother at 14, so this is just all I know. Apartment four North. A child, 11 years old, is left in charge of eight other children. The father is at work, the mother is away. Some real good eating fun. 
one, too. Like a McDonald's pure beef hamburger on a toasted bun. And enjoy a big bag of quick golden brown McDonald's french fries. You know, everything tastes so good because it's McDonald's. And wherever you live, there's a McDonald's study yeah, out there. If you live I sweep the floors, I take care of the baby, I wash the dishes, I clean the table, I watch the children, I do some cooking, and I do some shopping. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm the only person doing anything. Let me show you. It has eight blinking lights. These things blink on and off. See them going on and off? But you would find that this whole contraption here is good for absolutely nothing. When you get up in the morning, what are the first things you think about? What I have to do, you know, around the house. If I have to wash and do that, you know. That's the first thing I think about and eat. Do you look forward to each new day that comes along? No. Why not? Because don't nothing happen the day of the day. I never look forward to a new day. But why not? It's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing to do around here. Because most of the buildings are tore down and everyone is moving out, you know, now. This is Oakland Square, two blocks from the tenement. The area, designated a slum, is being redeveloped by urban renewal. This is the view of progress from 3823 South Ellis. 9.30 a.m., a front yard, three houses from the tenement. Mr. and Mrs. Peter Muckle own their own house next door to the tenement. We try to keep the house up and try to keep it as nice as we possibly can, but the people next door in the large building, they throw the garbage out all in the lawn and everything, the yard, and then they throw the garbage all out on top of the house. Now, you could take a peep out that window right there, right now, and see the garbage. And we have two garbage cans out on the back foot, and it won't do that. I just toss a whole lot of things out the one out the back, just to be tossed, you know, nothing else to do. Don't hurt yourself. 10 a.m. in the alley in back of the tenement. Run away fast now. Let's go now. Get the rags loaded. Come on. Children here look forward each morning to the arrival of Chico Belindo. He earns his living by collecting rags and junk. His helpers work for pennies and for the pleasure of his company. You want money, don't you? Oh, well, you like money. I like money, too. But you got to get the rags and junk out before you get your money. Hey, man! Yeah! Hey, hey man! Hey, junk man! Rag man! Pots and pans, everything you got to give away, folks, I'm here. Hey, junk man. Hey, red man. Red man, I'll be back at him sometime, yeah? You got the red, Bobby? Okay, I'll be back after a while. I'm going to come from the junk house. Ellis Avenue at 11 a.m. Well, most of the people, you know, they likes to uh, sit on the front porches watching, you know, see who's going into whose house, you know. They just know you like that. I think what's going on, I do is uh, grocery shopping, uh, clothes or something like that, on business. I always say, I'll take the kids to the museum, but when the time comes, I never get around to it. Even though it would be nice for the kids, most of the kids haven't even been past 63rd Street. They don't even know what the other side of town looks like. How do you spend your time? 
in the house, just looking at the TV. I'll be back. Mr. Fellow, it's coming betwixt Mr. and Mrs. Dragey. Hey, boy. What's on TV? Keep you busy. Oh, I'm up. Eight and nine. Nine hours. Oh, Lord, the boy. Hey, boy, go get some football. It's the same thing we did yesterday and the day before that. And I'm back. And seeing the same faces. Get bored. South Ellis Avenue at 245 p.m. The mailman brings checks from the welfare department to five of the nine families in this building. I think they feel a little guilty being up on me. Why? I guess they want to get out and work for themselves, but they know they can't get no help from nowhere else, so that's the only thing they can do is get on me. And in and one way, it's all right. I can be home now with the kids and getting them up and seeing them to be clean and coming in, I have the food ready for them. And I have more time to read and to raise them up right. Jack Beckwith in the basement apartment supports his wife and himself on his social security checks. I get about a... And uh, after I pay rent, well, I don't have too much left. Not too much. Well, it is really a bad feeling when you is a a uh, widow like myself, and one come to you, one of your children come to you and say, uh, want, I got to have some shoes or I need a coat, um, or a dress or a pair of pants or what have you, and, and you know they need this and, and then you don't be able to uh, get this for them. So you feel, you feel real bad. You feel like, girl, uh, you can't pass it. That's the way I do. It has been a time that I felt that way. afternoon play in a vacant lot near the tenement. My dream room. I would like to have a dining room, kitchen, say uh, three rooms, and a sun porch on the first floor. And the most of all, have a recreation center in like in the basement. I dream when I go to I got me a house where nobody living in there but me and my family. It wasn't no tall building like this one. It's just a plain old house. This is every man's dream to own his own home and to be able to have a decent place for your family to live in because you know if you own this, you know this is yours. And the house is going to be, it's going to be two TVs, one in the living room, one in the kitchen, built in the wall. Thelma Barber is a widow. Her children have been without a father for 10 years. A mother let children, you know, get back, you know, get back with a lot of things and the father won't. And um, he could tell you a lot of things if you're in trouble. You could go to him and explain how it is. You don't want to hurt your mother, so you rather talk it over with your father. He can, t he can sit down and talk to you, uh, tell you things that your mother, uh, you know, can't, like you do something your mother can't control you. And he can sit down and talk to you, talk about your problem, what's wrong with you, what your problem is. Well, I would 
come to him if I was in trouble, you know. I'd talk with him and I would tell him about my business. I wouldn't tell my mother. So I'd talk it over with him. What kinds of troubles were you? About school and about having children and um, having a relationship between, you know, me and my boyfriend or something like that. Like that. 6.30 p.m., dinner at the Moors, apartment 4 South. It's the time to say no and yes. That's the way to keep a tab on your child. If you know where he's going, that's the best thing. But don't always keep the child kept up in the house. This will make him feel well, that. What about when you don't know where the child is going? If they tell you you're going that's to go to one place. place and go another. That's your place. It is. As a mother, to find out and make sure that child is going that place. Well, what else I, I can't if the child leaves home and I think she's going one place and he's going another, then what I'm supposed to do? Ain't Look, if you ever find out this child did this, then it's time to take necessary measures to get this child some kind of punishment or something. The Johnson family, apartment one north. Bye here, put this food down, boy. Oh. Dear Lord, we vow to thank thee for this food. We were about to eat. Amen. Mm -hmm. My husband left me quite a few years ago now. When I raised my children up. I think now they're old enough enough now to know what to do now. They're old enough to know which side not to take. See, the old one, Floyd is 18. He's coming out of high school in June. And Mary is 60. And I told her now she know. Ask God to help her every night. We do to keep her mind occupied. And they can always don't care what the problem is. I tell them they'll never be ashamed to come to Mount Vernon. 10 p.m. in front of the town. People don't put their kids to bed like they should. Kids are running and screaming all up and down the street. It, it's nerve-wracking. Lead us not in the temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Thine is the kingdom, in the power, in the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good night, kids. Good night. I've been watching the late show for almost all this month and some of last month, too. And some late shows, they just stay on at 12.30 or 1 o'clock. And some go off at 12.30 and then uh, something else come on like M Squad or 77 Sunset Strip. And then they have a little news and then come on the Late Late Show. He's on TV. It looks like it's a pretty wonderful world. It's not, it's not the world I'm living in though. <laughs> I can't sleep because uh, they would be keeping up so much noise outside. They have their radio and record player going out there and hooting and hollering, saying any and everything they want to say. Well, I don't get to sleep until around about one day or two because uh, so much noise. Most of the adults who live in the tenement on South Ellis Avenue were born in rural areas of the South. They came to Chicago looking for a better way of life. They came to the south side of the city because they found that this was a place where Negroes were permitted to live. They came here without much education or sophistication in the ways of the city. They came here poor. About all that they brought with them were their hopes and their dreams. Bill Staples and his wife, Gloria, came from Alabama. Well, I mean, every man got a dream, you know. Everybody have a dream, and you dream of going any place to make good, you know, to make it better for my family, better education for my kids. These are the prime reasons that I came up for. Well, when I came to Chicago, I just thought I was going to something, you know, that was, just great, something I had never 
been to before. I just thought everything was just going to be like heaven, I guess, when I got here. But when I got here, I found out that it was. I found a better job, but I can't say that I found a better uh, living conditions because the living conditions uh, were not as good as they were in the South. The hope, the hope I really have, and I come here to do better. <laughs> but, uh, but after I, I got you and started away, it looked like to me I did worse because I was, <laughs> I made more money. I didn't make no more money, but I, I could save more money when I was living in Memphis, Tennessee. They found high rents in segregated slums, and in general, they found that the poor pay more. When you're new in a town like Chicago, the first thing, the easy credit houses are the worst ones. I mean, in other words, if you went in and bought, uh, this guy said, well, I'll take a chance on you. Okay, you buy $30, I'll pay $60 for it. This is a fact. And this man, once you buy a suit for him, you miss one payment, they have what is known here as a wage assignment. They found that the market for unskilled labor was shrinking. They found that in the North, too, the color of a man's skin could determine whether he got a job or a card in certain labor unions. Their women found an isolation they had never known in the South. It's very lonely. In fact, it's been lonely ever since I've been here because I would like to have somebody, even if it was a distant, you know, relative, somebody that I could, you know, maybe just talk to sometime when I need, you know, someone to talk to. Everyone. So it's pretty much safe, yeah. Because, I don't know, it might save a lot of frictions, you know. It's no one too charming. We all know one another and we uh, say hello and goodbye and that's it. They found overcrowding and not enough money to feed and clothe their large families. We don't never really have enough food. And it's, it's just a problem when you've got to worry about 11 people eating every day and mostly three times a day because they've got to eat. The kids have got to eat. If a kid gets sick, uh, your wife get ill, uh, and the least little thing you do, it upset, it unbalanced the cot. And once the cot is tipped and the apples begin to roll out and they just keep rolling and you can't pick them all back up. Fathers of some children in this building found their families could be helped by the welfare department, but only if they left home or died. I don't even dream anymore. I don't hope anymore. I'll give that part up, you know, a like girl longing for a husband and what have you, you know. I, I just, you know, bypass that, that's all. I'm just, just myself to the children, and I, I devote all my time to them, you know. And uh, when they're happy, I'm happy. When they say it, I'm sad. So that's the way it is. And I just don't have the, the drive that I used to have. I used to wanted to reach for the moon, and all of a sudden, it, it, the, uh, the dream is slowly began to fade away, and I just take life as it comes. The people in this tenement take life as it comes. They do not belong to civil rights groups or to community action centers, and most have not been reached by the war on poverty. Sometimes I just feel like just I know, I know it's, I know I just can't go away and just leave my kids like that, but sometimes I just have to get away, you know? I just have to get away. It's just too much for me sometimes. The time you feel that you're ready to throw up your hands and say, let's forget it all and just walk away. But with a little courage, you know, you get that little extra spark from somewhere. It's nothing that I can really do to forget because I don't drink. You know, a lot of people say drink. If you drink, maybe you'll forget. But I just can't drink. So I'm always worried. I'm just constantly worried all the time. For the children on Ellis Avenue, the summer ended on September 7th. This is the opening day of Donahue Elementary School, one block from the tenement. 
Here, 32 children are preparing for school. A nervous morning. The thing I hope for the most is that at least I would like for all of my girls to really be able to get an education, you know. So if they do marry and something happens between her and her husband, well, she will have something, you know, to fall back on if something happens. And she can take care of herself, you know. But I would really like for all of my kids to go to college because I found out for myself that with more education, the farther you can go. And with the change in times now, he can't blame these barriers that I went up against for not getting a job anymore. Come here. And what you gonna say to the teacher this morning? Uh, and you gonna say this? Uh, good morning. Yeah. You know your teacher's name? What's her name? You pressing that child to go on to school, quite not to go on to school. I didn't have no chance of going to school at all, because my mother paid when I was a boy. I said, y'all got a good chance of getting you a good education. I said, if y'all just only knew how I come up without a, a education, so y'all be running to school day and night. It seemed like I was mostly nervous that day. It was because I was, you know, the morning had been so hectic, you know, trying to get all the kids ready. And then it was just, it was just a hectic morning, that's all. I just really wasn't thinking about anything. I was really glad to have all the kids, you know, back in school that were going to school. Are you glad school has started? Good. What would you like to do this year in school? You don't know. <laughs> Do you think you'd like to learn uh, some games, some new games, some songs? Do you think so? Don't clap anything. One of the things that was bothering me was that the kids didn't have any breakfast that morning, and that was really, it was really was on my mind, you know. And I knew that they were coming back at 12 o'clock, and I don't really remember, but I don't think it was anything, you know, for lunch. All the boys and girls are waiting to meet you. Don't you come over and meet them with us? No. Oh, come on, let's go. They want to meet you, and I do too. We want to learn all about you. Boys and girls, this is a new little boy. Can you say good morning, Derek? Good morning, Derek. Fine. And Derek, you come over here. Mrs. Newton is going to help you. Okay? That's fine. Mrs. Newton is going to help you. All right. Go over to the circle with her. Now, boys and girls, are we ready? I have more and more children each year that do not know their names. They cannot respond when called by first name simply because they've only heard a nickname such as uh, Junior or Peaches or Cupcake or something of that sort. Therefore, I have to begin the kindergarten year trying to teach what should have been taught four years ago. Here comes the parade. If the child is severely handicapped in reading, the child is, has little chance of getting beyond the 16th birthday in the high school, they will drop out there because they do not experience any success. They cannot cope with the program. By the fall, destruction for urban renewal had moved to the threshold of the tenement. Most people in the building did not know what the city planners had in mind. Urban Renewal Commissioner, Lewis Hill. 3823 would be just about at this location. And what's going to happen there? Well, this would be also then part of the rebuilding program through here with the new apartment buildings and the tot lots and off-street parking space for the new residential community after it's cleared away. Eviction is part of tenement life. 
In September, the landlord told the tenants that their building had been sold to the Chicago Housing Authority. We will have to move, start looking for a place, but they didn't say when, you know. But, uh, and I still don't know, you know, how long we have, you know. They told me they was going to find me a place. They asked me what did I want to live at in the project, uh, out of the project. I said, well, I said, uh, I wouldn't mind taking the project, I don't guess. I said, well, we are sending an application to get you a project then. I think the buildings are nice, but it's just like taking one big slum and sit it in another slum because nothing has been changed. All the people are the same. They just move them from one place to another. My whole life is, uh, has me trapped, you know. Not just the building, but uh, the whole life has me trapped. South Ellis Avenue, December 1966. Christmas night for the first time in in about four or five years for a recreation. And guess where I went? I went to the club the least and uh, see the flow show. And I was just like a, a child had been out to a picnic. I was just as thrilled. <laughs> but I did enjoy it. They had a nice flow show. In February 1967, one of the first Negro tenants at 3823 South Ellis moved out. Mrs. Georgia Johnson had lived here for 15 years. In a way, I'm glad to leave in a way. In another way, I'm sorry. When you live in a place a long time and have two kids born in that place, that place really have a hold on you. And the kids, get, and my little boy, eight years old, he just love it. He just loves his little friends. He feels like he lost. And that's what really makes me feel really sad to leave the place. You will fall, baby. You can't get up there. Where's she going? I'm scared my sit down. You gonna take her down? Bring her down. Huh? Somebody wants to look down here. Oh, yeah. All right, we have to go now. Miss Lewis, you know that dress. We, we'll be there by the time y'all get there. Okay. I know everybody will come out here. Oh, come on, Flora. I'm just glad to move into this other place. It's churches all around, and that's really what I love. I, I love churches. They have a uh, nice street. And you can sit at the window, you can watch all of that. And it's really, it's a better place. It's a better place. Other families are still waiting to move out. I'm in hope that uh, things will get better with me, which I believe it will. And I'm in hope that uh, I would get in a, a good place to live. 
now which I believe I am. Well, I just, I'm just, I'm just got good hopes anyway. I don't, of course, I don't believe it could get much worse than he is with me right now. He couldn't get much worse, because if it did, I wouldn't be living at all. I hope to, that my husband and I will have a better life. That's the biggest thing I hope for, because last year was pretty bad for us. So I hope we can make it. In between the failures and the dismal things, you know, from then you have to try to just move over. Each one of them maybe push back a little bit, you know, but then you try to keep keep moving forward. But it takes time, and slowly you keep moving along. Let the wheel be done. 